Our salt marsh here is a recreated salt marsh, and what we have is a nice kind of channel of water, a big, kind of like a big puddle that was dug out, and it's filled naturally with the water from the estuary that flows around the land and comes in and fills this big, what looks like a big puddle. And right now we have low tide, so you can see some of the mud along the banks, and you can see where all these tall green grasses start growing. And these grasses are called Spartina alterniflora, or saltwater cordgrass. And they were planted here because they're sort of what helps to get a salt marsh growing. Um, they grow right at the fringe or the edge of the water. They like to be covered with the salt water. Um, twice a day when the high tide comes in, they get covered. And they can grow in the salt water because they have a special adaptation of essentially sweating out the salts, the same way that we sweat and salt comes out of our body. The plants do the same thing. And if you take a close-up look at the blades of the grasses, you can actually see the salt crystals on there. Um, you can run your finger along and taste them, and it's definitely salt from the estuary water. So the Spartina alterniflora, the cordgrass, grows down by the water. And then as you come in towards the land where there was different plants that were put in the ground here because this is where they grow, and this um, helps form the salt marsh habitat. And all of these grasses and plants grow where they do um, because they're affected by how far that salt water comes up on the land. So the cordgrass is down close because that likes to get covered with the water. And then behind that, we have this one here called Spartina patens, or um, like a saute grass and it can get covered once in a while but it doesn't like to be covered all the time with the salt water. So it can handle a little bit of salt water so it grows further back and then as we go back further we get different plants and different transition zones that grow in here. Um, right here down in here is a grass, a plant called um, salicornia or glasswort, um, sometimes called sea pickles. You can actually eat that one and it's in salads at times. Um, it's very salty um, it's a succulent plant, so it holds, holds the salt water inside of it. And behind that, if we go a little further back, there's seaside goldenrod, which is this plant here, which um, will be flowering in the fall and migrating butterflies rely upon the flowers that this um, plant produces in the fall as a primary food source, especially monarch butterflies, on their migrations down to South America. Behind that plant, as we go further away from the water, there is um, marsh elder, um, which is this one here, which is also has kind of some thick waxy leaves to protect it from the salt water that's found out here. And then further back we get other plants. And um, back in there, those higher trees are um, groundsel trees. And they grow even kind of on the basic, on the fringe or the edge of where the salt marsh habitat is. And behind those we get into what's considered an upland habitat. So all of these plants were put here in their specific zones and areas because that's where they grow and that's where they can provide the most nutrients and to help this marsh to survive. And these cord grasses, um, as Kathy said, are most important when they're dead. Even though they look pretty now, as they're growing, they're good to have here for certain animals to hide in. But once they die and rot and decompose and, and form what's called detritus, all that energy in them gets put back into the estuary and that's what small fish eat. And then bigger fish eat the smaller fish and sometimes we eat the bigger fish. So that's pretty much the importance of the salt marsh habitat and the plants here.